Hello, this is producer Pete, and just before we start tonight, I'd like to tell you why this show and the following two are particularly special. Now, in a few days' time, it'll be the 11th of November, Remembrance Day, Armistice Day, Poppy Day, Veterans Day. The occasion is marked in various ways around the world, but here on Litopia After Dark, well, we have our own ways of doing things. Now, this show and the following two form a trilogy of shows about war. In a few moments, you're going to hear from war reporter, writer and journalist Tim Butcher talking about the teenage assassin who triggered the First World War by murdering Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo. And you may think you've already heard enough about this particular event. Well, I can assure you, you haven't heard Tim. Now, our next show, in just a day or two, will feature the international editor for Channel 4 News, Lindsay Hilson. One of a very select group of female war reporters, Lindsay was the only English-speaking foreign correspondent in Rwanda when the genocide started, and she's covered all the major conflicts in the past two decades, including the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And then, to complete our war trilogy, we will be releasing on November the 11th, perhaps the most controversial show we've ever produced. There's little point discussing war unless you're prepared to listen to the soldiers who actually fight them. Our guest on Remembrance Day will be a soldier who served his country in our most recent conflicts, not as a foot soldier, but as part of the world's most elite fighting force, the SAS. The use of special forces in conflicts has skyrocketed in recent years as governments seek to fight wars out of public view and away from public scrutiny. I think you're going to find the real-life story of this elite warrior who is now an activist for peace to be one of the most remarkable testaments you've ever heard. So there we are. Three stories told in Latopia After Dark's unique way. I hope you appreciate them. Live and uncensored. Uncensored. If you're an idiot American like me, you might be wondering, why are the Brits so hung up on the First World War? 100 years ago, Gavrilo Princip shot Archduke Franz Ferdinand and thus began World War... <clears throat> ah, oh, right, the poppies, Wilfred Owen, Warhorse, the sum. But if you live here a while, you realize that 100-year-old conflict left an angry scar on the British psyche. So who exactly was Gavrilo Princip? What were his core, um, sorry, principles? To shine an intriguing new light on this subject, we've dragged self-confessed hack journo Tim Butcher to the studio. Why? Because Timbo didn't just read the book on World War I. Timbo bloody wrote it. Intelligent listening for dangerous minds. This is Latopia. This is Latopia. Latopia after dark. After dark. After dark. After dark. Mr. Tim Butcher. Timbo, may I call you Timbo? Yeah, sure. Why not? Why not? You uh, you grew up in Northamptonshire? <laughs> Northamptonshire? <laughs> North... Sorry, I'm American. We don't do the Shire. We don't do mate. But you live in South Africa. You you, you live in Johannesburg. I actually live in Cape Town. Which in is, Cape Town, uh, sorry. In South Africa. Yeah, I live in Cape Town. My first question is, uh, have you ever been carjacked? Uh, yeah, in London. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> come on now. Come on. Come on. What's the dangerous things? No, come on. South Africa, don't read, but don't believe what you read in the papers. It's it's, uh, it's, it's got the highest great... armed robbery. Has highest... it hell? Has it hell? No. Christ, in, it's in Switzerland that they own more weapons per 100,000 people than they do in South Africa. No, let's get real. I mean, uh, South Africa gets a bad press. Frankly, I'm delighted. You're right. War is hell. Send more money. Don't come to South Africa. Stay away. It's great. Hey, I love it. I've been there a few times. <laughs> but, you know, that's not believe. Don't believe what you read in the newspapers. South Africa, sure, it has a, there's a crime issue. Absolutely. But no, uh, I feel so Violent more... crime, assault... I mean, not the yeah. big ones, the murder rate, you know, th we Americans, we hold our own. 
Yeah, uh, Colombia is number one, but South, no, Africa, South Africa used to be there about ten years ago. But Colombia, Brazil, and some parts of you know uh, some other places are, uh, are much worse now. So no, come on, let's let's be real. The sun shines in South Africa. Why am I there? I can think. I've been all over the world, and I can think of nowhere else I'd rather be. It's a really cool place. It's got a nice edge to it. It's the edge of a yeah, of an speaking, American speaking, football. Speak, you know, let, me, let me talk in your language. An uh, American football okay, or yeah. a rugby ball. If we're with us, it's the equilibrium of the ball standing on its end. You know, it sits there. That's an equilibrium, but it's a very dynamic you touch it it's going to really rock and roll but if you put the ball on its side it's a static equilibrium it's really boring i, I realize Europe, i realize you south africa i realize you've done a lot of interviews but i do believe you did not answer the question have you been carjacked uh yeah in london absolutely <laughs> <laughs> i told you i answered the question did you not catch it all right let's let, let's <laughs> i've never been carjacked in south africa okay Touché. thank I've you never, there I've, we are yeah. okay ha, do, do, are you familiar with the home invasion protocol uh no no is this, just, the, is this the... Well, no, no, I'm not. You can't go ahead. When I was in Johannesburg, um, there was a very... I, I was staying with friends, and they said there's a very sort of strict home invasion protocol where if someone comes over the fence, you just keep your head down, you don't look at it, and you just let them have everything. Oh, no yeah. speaking, no... Yeah, yeah. And that, that happens. Do you live in a fortified compound? Do you have an electrified fence around your property? you have a lovely family? I don't live behind... A fence, electric fence. I live behind a wall. How tall? Uh, six foot wall. Like a, you know, you know, Christ, you know, it's, I live in, and I do not live in any of these, in one of these compounds that you refer to. I live on the sea, looking at the ocean, where the dolphins are. Oh, and yeah. I see them, now I see that's them a good fence. Around, and I see them blipping around. Um, but, you know, let's not get complacent. I live, a re you know, we live in a regular house and we live in Cape Town. We're lucky. If we lived in Joburg, you're right. In Joburg, this standard thing. The standard thing is to have a fence. And I have lived in Joburg for five years, and you all have a fence. And I it's think. strange. You get used to pressing a button. You come in at night, you press a buzzer. You don't ever press the buzzer if you see another car on your road. Yeah. You never, yeah. ever do that. And the strange thing is, think about anywhere in, in Los Angeles where you're from, or London where you now live, or where anywhere in the world, where is it that there are no cars on the road? And in Joburg, people have space. So they all garage their cars off the road. For sure. So nothing is on the road. And if you see one at night, that's a big red light. That's a wah, wah, wah. That's a, oh, God, that's a You good. really don't want to be on the roads yeah, after you don't want to be seeing. You don't want to be seeing people uh, parked on the street because that means something. So, you know, you just learn, and it becomes a sixth sense, and you back your car in, and blah de blah de blah Yeah, you know. Well, I, I'm giving you a hard time. I love South Africa, and I actually found a lot of parallels between Johannesburg and Los Angeles. There is this sort of mall culture um, you you really don't want to make you, you really don't want to get off the freeway at the wrong exit. You know, sure. you, you, you so sure don't want. We've all You know, you get off the wrong exit, that can you know, world can turn on its head. Mall culture. You're right. I mean, I never, I've never eaten in a restaurant in a mall before I go to South Africa, and now I think it's normal. <laughs> but you know, in the UK, you do not go to malls to shopping centres. No, it's terrible. I mean, it, it's they try to bring it in. They've got two big ones here, uh, Stratford and Westfield, and they're absolute horror zones. But I'd like to say that. From where I'm from in, in Los Angeles and Santa Monica, we had the first mall, and from there spread the diaspora. Oh, right. That was so, the original the load of it, the mother load. You're welcome. Thank you. So where is home for you? My home is Cape Town. My home is Cape Town. I'm a Brit. I've been overseas for a long time. I've got two children. One was born in Bethlehem. That'll be Bethlehem in the West Bank. Wait, what, are, you, are you starting the religion or not? I no, missed no, that no, part. No, 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 no. He he, we, we made sure he wasn't born in December. He was born in August. Oh, God, you'd if hate we, to have your presents a, on the same day. If I had a Portuguese wife, we could have gone for the Jesus first name. But we That would have been sweet. We went for Kit. And a child born in the UK as well. Um, and I guess, you know, the world we live in, you know, we can be talking about a little bit about this later, about Gavrilo Princip and what nationalism means and identity. But what is your identity now where, you know, we're talking to, you know, I'm talking to some people now who I'll never see, but I feel perfectly communi comfortable communicating with them. And they could be anywhere on the planet. You know, it could be from any social cohort or age cohort. And I wonder, you know, when my kids, I've got a, uh, an eight-year-old son, a six-year-old daughter now, you know, what is their world going to be when they're adults in terms of nationality? Well, they're not, they're be, not rootless. They're if not I were root a parent of a six or eight year old, I'd be thinking, "Is the world going to be here?" I know. Yeah, that's the truth. Well, you've got a dog. You know, you care about your dog. That's you dog. don't know if the dog's going to be there. You know, who's going to look after the dog in this five is years' true. time? And this is the, the, it, it touches on in our world. You know, in twenty years' time, what will national national identity be? And uh, it's intriguing. I find it. I find it intriguing. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by that idea of how deep your roots have to be. To, to have a home and do, a do you feel that uh, we're heading to a since we're, we're going to be talking about uh, world wars and such do you do you feel we're heading into a world without nations is that the way forward well I wonder I mean nations have given us a lot of bloody wars haven't they I mean let's talk about nationalism 
we'll be talking about it now because we're talking about the First World War. Yeah. But what does it spawn? Yeah. It spawns a thing called National Socialism. Remember that? Got that word in there? National. Yeah. Remember him? That guy, Mr. A. Hitler. He was going on about this thing called right. the German nation. And that was the most extreme and the most toxic form. Yeah. And what are we doing now? What are we doing now, now as we're talking? Well, in eastern Ukraine, people are dying because of this issue. Of how Russian are you to be Russian? That's right. How Ukrainian are you to be Ukrainian? So nations, I, in a way, it's a bit like sort of organized religion. Well, there's, there's two arguments. You, you can say that all the nations warring with each other and deciding who's who in nationalism uh, along ethnic lines is, is pulling the world apart. But if you have a world government, which is only going to happen if the aliens, if and when the aliens appear, and we all say, oh, wow, we all have to unite against a common cause, or the zombies... Uh, then you have a concentration of power. Who's the world president? You can't put more power into someone's hands. I think that would be but, Tony Blair. But, but <laughs> he'd certainly put himself forward. The super tanned, the 24-7 tanned Tony Blair. He looks Blair. good. Oh, the, God, what would he charge for a speaking engagement then? I'll tell you exactly what he... Oh, no, I won't, actually. It's so too embarrassing to have even know this. Well, you talked about the world. You know, Do you need aliens to come to join up? Winston would Churchill, be sweet. 1946, the Fulton, Missouri speech. People remember the words, the Iron Curtain, because he uses the word Iron Curtain in that speech. And they're very powerful words. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has come down. Those are the great that was words. pretty good. Those are the great words. However, I challenge, Google that speech, Google Fulton, Missouri, and read the next few paragraphs because what he's actually I saying i have a feeling that the uh the historian in you is about to but make what he's actually appearance. saying what's well, intriguing is that 1946 he's saying if we're serious about the united nations and not having the war that we've just lived through in the second world war winston churchill cigars you know roosevelt the whole lot fdr joe stalin you know the big three if we're not going to have that terrible terrible war again then we're going to have to be serious about the United Nations. It's going to be a single government for the world with a single police force and a single army. You read it, it's like a nightmare for any sort of libertarian, oh, you know, the, the guys in Montana with the guns, the government's going to come and get us. And Churchill was spelling it out in 46. It's intriguing. Hello, I'm Eric Beck Rubin, hardcore out of control book enthusiast, inviting you to listen to a new show here on Latopia called Burning Books. Every three weeks, we put out a new podcast on a single book. It could be a recent debut, a classic, fiction, nonfiction, and everything in between. The idea is to explore what lies at the heart of great books, books that try to be great but don't quite make it, as well as, now and then, books that are irredeemably bad. So check out our archive shows on Latopia, and we'll look forward to having you join us for our next podcast. Burning Books, exclusively from Latopia.com. But that segues very nicely. The UN uh, trying to flex its muscle for the first time, really. Well, you were sent as a cub reporter by the Telegraph into the Balkan conflict. And, um, you know, you, you, you went over there and you saw some crazy shit. Let's, um, yeah, let's place what we're talking about here. We're talking about the Balkans. We're talking about Southeast Europe and we're talking about a little bit of it. We're talking about a place called Bosnia. And we might Thank remember... You. Thank you for dumbing it down for us. And we might remember... You know, speak to us as if we were a we precocious remember, nine-year-old. We might remember Christian Amanpour on CNN standing there in a city called Sarajevo in the 90s waxing lyrical about Bosnia. And for a while it was on our radar. It was really, really, really important. But of course, wait, post- is this post this but the Olympics is what I remember. <laughs> you, what you remember Torvalindine? You Yeah, Torvalindine of- was that Sarajevo? Oh Super god, I had right. to watch that ice Bolero, dancing. Bolero, Bolero, my god. Please. You're in touch with your soft side if you love your little bit of Bolero. No, I was forced I was forced to watch that. It's amazing I came anyway, out heterosexual. So, so the um so we're in Bosnia, it's the 1990s. The Cold War has ended. The Berlin Wall's come down and we think thank god we got through the Cold War so, without okay. mutually assured destruction. No one got killed and holy shit, suddenly there's a lot of fighting going on. The country is Yugoslavia. That means a country of Yugoslavs, yeah. southern Slavs. There's a lot of them. And the country, the centrifugal forces, is driving it apart. So we have a small war in Slovenia, a longer war in Croatia, and then a really horrible war in Bosnia. That's our timeline. We're in the 90s. But the reason I'm intrigued is because it's the same place that at the beginning of the century gives us the First World War. So you this mentioned is, it's it in very, your intro. It's very neatly bookended. That's a, ni- that's, a, that's a nice term. Where did you get that from? It bookends the combat of the 20th century. 
1914 starts the First World War. Where does it come from? 1914, um, the First World War is sparked in Bosnia. Remember, it's not caused, but it's sparked there. And blow me down if in the 1990s, in Bosnia, another war happens. And this is kind of important for two reasons. First of all, you mentioned the UN cutting its teeth. It was the UN cutting its teeth, and almost more importantly, NATO. NATO dropped its first bomb in anger. It had been training for 40 years, right? 40 years, aiming those guns, yeah. arming itself. It, it drops a bomb for the first time in April 1994, and it misses. <laughs> you know? I have to say, it was all a bit embarrassing. It was in a place called Garage Day. They called it an F-16. It, you know, it wasn't right. Okay, well, that's on the egg analogy. Like, if you're stockpiling eggs, they're going to go bad at some point. So it's time to start. If you see somebody who's got two dozen eggs, they're, they're going to make some omelets. And you have to break a few, so the first one got broken. It got, yeah. Then indeed, what happened? Indeed. But this is intriguing. This is intriguing. At the time, as a reporter running around central Bosnia, dealing with a complicated war, we're talking ethnicities. So we've got Bosnian Croats killing Bosnian Muslims. You've got Bosnian Muslims killing Bosnian Serbs. Hold it. Yeah, cutting deals. It's opaque. It's tricky. But let me plant this in your mind. We all know about 9-11. 9-11, 19 skyjackers flying those planes into the towers and crashing them into a field and into the Pentagon. Two of those guys were in Bosnia. The guys who sent them, Khaled Sheikh Mohammed, who was Osama bin Laden's principal planner of 9-11, was in Bosnia. So three ugly examples of modern combat. Jihadists, people who are prepared to fight for some crazy caliphate ideal and kill innocent people. And part of their bloodline, their story, is years they spent in Bosnia. So again, a freaky little hold on history this country has. So you were over there working for the Telegraph and you were pretty excited back then. I mean, you, that was a big story for you. That was oh, a big assignment. Come on, it was my first, was first time I went to war. Me with my big head crammed into a tiny little tin hat and I had my little body armor on. I had my little thing called the satellite telex. You Google had, that, Google that. You'll have not... You, you know, had a I'm, war boner. <laughs> well, indeed. I, was, I, I prefer to call it peacock proud strutting <laughs> around, but if you want to go for that... I, I do, actually, yeah. strangely enough. So it's a war, yeah, and it's exciting. I was in my 20s and you go there and as I say, the layers are comp... Are comp complex. But the one thing I did know, the one thing that was parked in my mind going to Sarajevo is, hold on, as you said in your intro, hold on, we do know that my history. The First World War is triggered in 1914 because Archduke Franz Ferdinand is killed in Sarajevo by a student. And if you're like Ian Wynne and you're awake and paying attention, you even remember the student's name. I oh, know you're not, you're dreaming about, you're dreaming about, um, about, about squid and octopus. You're not paying, you're not <laughs> I am paying the attention. octopus beside oh, you. You're not, you're not paying attention. I do think quite a bit about you, the octopus, sorry. If he's holding onto his muscular leg, there's only one. Um, but there's uh, eight if you count them. brain tissue what, you in think there. I'm going to get a cup that's got six? It's not a hexapus. Come but, on now. There's more brain tissue in that, um, in that single leg there than, than in the rest of me. Anyway, the point is, if you paid attention, you would remember that the assassin was called Gavrilo Princip. Well, kind of, you know, I remember that. So, Sarajevo, that's parked in my mind's eye. I'm dealing with a complicated war, but at least that war makes sense. I mean, he was a local guy, he shot the colonial occupier, and he drove the colonial occupier out. Okay, that's he... it. For an American, that's where we stop. Yeah, yeah. The, the Lusitania went down, there yeah, were yeah. 2,000 people died, we, had, we lost like 100 dudes, and none of them were famous. So, you know, <laughs> well, that's all we know. So everything you're going for, we're building up an audience. Imagine people are 19 now. Well, Boardwalk Empire, Boardwalk Empire, we have a reference in there to the first World War. It's very rare in contemporary American this culture. This is true. We, we have, have the guy coming. We have a couple two people guys, coming back. Two guys, de you know, demonized. And it wasn't just a hundred Americans. One hundred and fifty thousand Americans die in the first. World I'm War. just it's talking crazy. about Lusitania. Oh yes, so forgive me. Sorry. The sinking uh, of Lusitania. But, we lost one hundred and twenty-eight people. And, and you go to uh, war over it. You go to war. You're drawn in. You're drawn in. Yeah. Anyway, so so um, the First World War. I kind of park that in my mind. That's that's kind of parked, right? I'm dealing with the complexities of this of this modern war. And I'm in Sarajevo, there's a siege on. You might remember a small city, bad guys on the hills, good guys in the ground, in, hiding in the buildings. Boom, 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 boom. A lot of people dead, horrible scenes. Sniper people, alley. Pe sniper alley, people, as in an alley with snipers on it. You had to run between road junctions when the bit the, the, the Well, as I understand you it, you were, you were there. There's, there's like this sort of U-shaped valley in the towns down there. And so it's anyone tiny, who has yeah. the high ground... Just, com I mean, militarily I, has control. It's, of a, it's a beautiful, in, 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 its, in medieval terms, it's a cupped hand of a city. But in modern era, very bad, because the bad guys can plant their guns here and whack everyone. Anyway, so that was going on. During a lull in the shelling, I walk around the city, 
and I found a small building. It's an anonymous building, and it's got another great big crater in the roof because a shell's gone through the roof, which is totally standard for Sarajevo. And I walk inside. Oh God, what are their people doing? They're using it as a bathroom. Neither here, neither. They're just they're using it. Uh, you know. Okay. Okay. Use your word. Use your your dirty potty mouth word. Yeah. I'll they're using it. it as a bathroom, and then I go around the back, and hold on, it's a tomb. It's not just a tomb. It's a tomb of the man who triggers the First World War, and people are crapping on it. They're shitting on his grave. They're shitting on his grave. Okay, so... This guy, this gunman, Gavrilo Princip, was buried in Sarajevo in controversial circumstances. We can come to that. And they're shitting on his tomb. Hold on. And I'm having this... I had a bit of a sort of wobbly moment when the screen goes, whoa, hold on. This doesn't make any sense. So, this is... Is this a where... public service disaster more than anything? Like, oh, well, it's... You know, was it, was it a crapper of convenience? <laughs> No, it was a genuine. It was a genuine political gesture, in as much as the guy's name. Seriously, the guy's name, come the nineteen nineties, had gone, had morphed, had morphed. It had gone on a sign curve, and it was at the bottom of the sign curve. It was right at the bottom of the dip. We can talk about that in a second. But the point is, this guy who was settled in the narrative of the First World War, he should be a hero for these people, and he's now a villain. They're crapping on his tomb. So that's the seed of this book that I've written, the trigger. Did I wanted to <coughs> understand how. He could go from perceived hero to perceived villain. All right, two questions. One, did you have a, at least a waz on the grave? <laughs> no, I did not. I got my earnest little journalistic notebook out and wrote my diary, took a few photographs, and then went outside. Your eyes were watering from the stench. It wasn't pleasant. It wasn't a flush. I, uh, it wasn't a flush tomb. Talking, is what I'm we're saying. Talking, we're talking. You know, you know, use tampons, loo paper, crap, piss. Hello, this is Gary Bushell, and I'd like to invite you to try my new show here on Litopia, entitled, somewhat functionally, I think, The Gary Bushell Talk Show. As you may infer from the title, it's a show where people talk to me. But that really doesn't begin to do it justice. My guests are household names, from entertainment, politics, the arts and sciences. You'll recognise the names, but you've never heard them talk like they do on my show. Exposing big ideas, revealing even bigger secrets. Uncensored conversation. No spin, no ball. Straight from the heart, direct to you. Join me, the Gary Bushell Talk Show. It does what it says. But you were there covering the conflict. This was sort of a, a, a peripheral thing that just sort of struck your imagination. What was it like for you, as in like war wounds? You describe in the book uh, sort of feeling of helplessness of watching the, well the as a journalist we, we it's a great privilege to go and watch these raw things taking place war is human emotion at its most raw people are doing the ultimate thing it is survival people are dying or you're told you're going to die you've got two, two, you've got 30 seconds to work out what you're going to grab what do you grab from here what does peter grab from his home you've got 30 seconds to leave it it's pretty bloody raw and as a journalist it's very i find it very uh, it was a privileged position to watch this drama playing out. It was a, this is history. I mean, this genuinely is. History this is happening. Is, that is, is what, it, well, that is what is attracts point. people into the, into the is, military theatre to become war, war what's, reporters. What's going on now in Aleppo as we speak is another siege. What was going on a few years ago in Helmand, a few years before that in Baghdad, in Syria, in wider Syria, in other locations. You know, it, it is... It, frankly, Dozens frankly, of places just, across I get off, Africa. I get, off, I get off on the excitement of of history playing out. And it was European history at its most febrile. It was happening, it was active. But Personalize it's a, shitty, it, it's a shitty experience. It's not just the getting shot at no. or having friends who were killed. The worst thing for me was the sense of, of guilt, of voyeuristic guilt, because you're watching this thing and you're not influencing it positively. You're watching really, really bad things happen. Now, lesson one, day one, journalism school, Remain objective. Remain objective. Actually, don't listen to that part of the course. It's full of shit. Journalism comes alive when you own it. Yeah. When you own yeah. the story. And you own it doesn't mean you're biased. No. And it doesn't mean but it means you've got red blood coursing through your so. veins. Yeah, you're up. You know, you feel for it. So you, you we called the Bosnian War very early on. Bosnian Serbs, bad guys. The extremists, bad guys. Bosnian Muslims, they weren't all pure. But women getting killed, standing in a water Does, queue, children getting decapitated. Doesn't look good. That's not cool. 
And there was some, you know, and there was some bad moments. And okay, for me, for me, the the worst moment. Remember, we all know the Holocaust. We all know the narrative of the Holocaust in Europe. In 1995, Thank the you, Holocaust. Steven Spielberg, once again, the Holocaust comes back to Europe. Eight thousand, eight thousand, maybe nine thousand people, men are killed in the woods of eastern Bosnia for no other reason than they're the wrong type of ethnic group. They weren't fighting. They weren't a threat. You know, it's literally, it's Jews against non-Jews. It's, it's still, sort of, it, but compared to the Holocaust, it's microcosmic. It's pretty small beer. Oh, come on, man. I mean, numbers, we're not measuring, you know, we're not saying the same numbers, but we're saying the same disgusting racial right. toxic Ethnic cleansing. Attitude. Ethnic cleansing is, came into so the vernacular I've, from that conflict. But you wrote a book called The Trigger about what started it. If you had PTSD, what would be your trigger? From that conflict, what is the thing Seeing that sticks out? Seeing a man with facial hair pointing his finger at me, that would really... Come on now, I'm asking you, you can't just go to these things and not be haunted. Jonas are very fortunate because the reason that people do suffer from PTSD, uh, soldiers, firemen, policemen, whoever, is because they don't talk about it. They don't, and you need to bottle it up. And that's the thing. Now, the thing about journalists is, the, what do we do? So, wait, are you going go to continue on. to talk around this bush? Or just like you're just yeah, grabbing no, well, no, hold, really on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's a long walk to get to the trigger here. <laughs> no. The, um, you know, Bosnia for me was the first time I have walked through human bones on the floor. The first time I've seen dead kids and mothers have handed me dead kids. The first time that I've found women who've hung, a woman who'd hung herself in a tree and she's lying there lifeless, stand, you know, just hanging there lifeless. And piecing her, I mean, finding the shock of finding this woman was bad enough, and the flies landing on her lips and her lips not having any reflex in them, and, you know, that human reflex. If you have a fly, you do that sort of muscular. To see that on a summer's morning, July the 11th, 1995, to see that was, was freaky. But the more damaging thing is to then find the two children she left behind and see their hollowed out lives. They've lost their father. The reason she dies is because the father has been murdered. Now they've lost their mother. And to hold their hands. And was, they, they're watching, go- they're this seeing is go- her. This is, this is goose, no, they didn't say that. I can't honestly say they saw her in the tree. They saw her later. And this is goosebump moment for me because, but you know, the point about, the questions you're asking, which are perfectly valid, is that one feels, I feel, and a lot of my journalist tribe feel, we can't go on and on about this and make it about us. Because the real shit was happening to a woman who's hung herself and a menfolk, and there are 8,000 menfolk who died in this situation. And to make any sort of moral comparison or a moral equivalence, is, I feel very uncomfortable with that. I don't call it survivor's guilt. I call it, it's a journalist voyeuristic guilt. And you're right, and I'm glad it moved you because it was a powerful section of this book, The Trigger, that I wanted to convey, is that it's a great privilege to go and watch these things as a journalist, but it comes with a price. The price being that you might want to reach an end state which is different from the reality and it's it's heartbreaking as in it is it destroys you doesn't it make you feel profoundly depressed i mean war correspondents are famous for suffering from absolutely absolutely and depression. i'm no longer a war correspondent i've got children and i made that decision a few years ago it is a young person's game i am i used to be a lot younger and uh, now i've got to this certain age uh, and you and can either thrill. be a good one or an old one yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I ended up as an old man. I was, I, when they start describing you as a veteran. Um, but it was not just depressing. It is. It just kind of rips all of your values and destroys them and unstitches them. We were watching the Un- United Nations had told these people, this is one of the great lies of the modern era. They had told them, you're in a safe area. We'll come and look after you. We will not abandon you. Those were the words used by the UN commander, General Philippe Morion. I will not abandon you. And this is an organization that was formed in the aftermath of World War II. To avoid the Holocaust. To avoid this. To make sure that... War- One thing we're not going to do is this whole, like, wipe well, let me out tell you how, groups of people. Let me tell you that, you know, frankly, <laughs> you know, it's... These senior people at the United Nations, they should be you know, held to account for this. Because what do they produce? Do they produce world peace? Do they hell? They produce one thing and one thing only. Paper. Paper. Yeah. Paper. Anyway, let's not talk about the UN. It's, it's kind of... It, it, well, they're, hamst- they're hamstrung by the, they were hamstrung their, mem- by by the, their own by individual the members. By the political reality is that the Fulton, Missouri speech, which said, if you're serious about the UN, you've got to beef them up. And no one's prepared to do that because yeah. of the nation states. The United States wouldn't even allow, wouldn't even sign up for the International Criminal Court for crying out loud. You know, it wouldn't even accept the jurisdiction. Let alone like Kyoto or any kind of like environmental no. treaty. No. So, but going back, 
Bosnia was a big deal, frankly, for anyone who went there, whether they were an aid worker, a soldier, a peacekeeper, or a journalist. So, okay. And we were very... This was real drama, Ian. I mean, we're talking, we're talking Europe doing things which it hadn't done for 50 years. These evil, evil, evil extreme politicians on all sides poking, poking the envelope to see what can we... Can, we, can, get, we, get away can we get away with murder? Can we get away with murder? They did for years, but for some, years they did. They finally got the you know they finally got the people who run, who ran them and put them through court and yeah, you know, true and well well annoyingly for for some sort of sense of natural justice he dies of natural causes whilst in whilst in the court but um, Radko Mladic is going through now of course Karadzic as well and there have been some other underlings but that Bosnia is this funny little place it triggers the First World War in 1914 and we're talking about it with passion now because the world goes to war in Afghanistan, partly because it was part of the incremental well, steps. All it was baby the, steps in All Bosnia. the major wars that are being fought now, recently, what Afghanistan, Iraq, what's kicking off in Syria, across the Middle East, they were, it's all part of what the Ottoman Empire... Yeah, true enough, so true enough, true enough. True they're enough. all being... True and enough. all of that was a, you know, was affected by the events of, of World War One and Two. Indeed, indeed. And, uh, you know, that's about all I know off of Wikipedia. I very carefully plotted murder for several months I decided that I was gonna I was gonna kill him and had it very well I thought laid out but there's always that X factor that you never take into account I don't think that there's a jury in this country that would have convicted me of murder this is Litopia after dark the net's first and foremost literary salon. So you're a battle-scarred, hardened war reporter. You've gone and you've seen some... Uh, did you cut the woman down from the tree? Or did you just have no, to I stand didn't. back? No, I didn't. Uh, uh, a, a, did little boy, a little boy to, led, led me to her. And as I got there, some guys who had already been led by the little boy's friend were coming and they were cutting her down. This happens to you a lot. When we had you on the show before talking about Blood River, you discussed an event where some where a young boy was like, "Yeah, you want to see the bones?" and oh, yeah, brought you bones, in yeah. and brought you into the tree. This is a running theme with you. You might think beware that, children wanting to show you bones, sir. You might have you, a, might, you might think that it might be a sort of construction. I make up this little boy who just sort of grazes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Then there was this little boy who appears and he he shows me shit, really bad stuff. Uh, is like Damien from I Drop the Dead Donkey with his little, uh, his little. Uh, oh my God, Damien's there because there's the same doll in the image. Whenever there's a fire or a car crash or a war zone, it's always the doll. Damien. I, I really like how you had, you had that sincere expression, like this had just dawned on you. This <laughs> this little conceit, but that's fine. We'll let it go because it does come across as incredibly realistic. So you've had this, you've had this moment. You've gone to, you've gone to this shitter in Sarajevo, and there is the tomb of uh, Gavrilo Princip, the. 19-year-old who pulled the trigger, killed Franz Ferdinand, started World War One, and therefore two, and started history of Europe. The starting gun for modern history. That gun wasn't just an assassin's gun. It was the starting gun for modern history. Most World War One narratives, they tend to focus on, um, you know, that, that Europe at that time was just a huge room full of gasoline or dominoes or whatever it is. And they focus on the fact that it was inevitable. There was so much fuel building sure, up. Sure. But you turned your laser beam onto the dude who threw the match, who pushed that first Crew, domino no, down. Yeah, it's quite right. Historians have quite rightly given a good old look at the different statesmen. Oddly enough, they wore, you know, the, the politicians and chancellors and statesmen and plenipotentiaries, they wore facial hair a bit like yours at the Whoa. time. All this, all this mutton chops and things a yeah. uh, hundred years ago. I'm, I'm doing the, vic I'm doing the, the Victorian thing the for the next century. The historians quite so rightly know. have looked at all of the decisions that were made, that what you might call the domino sequence, one after the other. Vienna's decision to put an ultimatum on the surface. We nation. like a linear so, you know, progression. Like, exactly. In a way, historians like to tidy up the really, really random, entropic, Brownian motion chaos of real life. They want to kind of tidy it up. And of course, vision, the clarity of vision for historians is 2020 when looking backwards. Right. Brilliant in retrospect. Looking forwards, and the, ooh, it all gets a bit foggy and out of focus. But that's the reality. And they've quite rightly looked at that. That's a big old forest, the origins of the First World War. In crude terms, we call it the July crisis, July of 1914, where Britain was saying this and France was saying the other and the Belgians and the Russians. And it the is Austrians. very confusing. It's a big tree, a big, big forest with a lot of trees. And I am a bear of little brain. 
I've decided. Oh come on, no, man. No, 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 listen, no, no, listen. no, 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 no I'm listen. sorry. No, I've read, I've, I've no, made listen. my this way through it. This is a forest it. with clear it up. This is a forest. You go in there with a chainsaw, is, my friend. This is a forest with a lot of trees, and I pick on one tree, and one tree is the one that dropped the acorns. Oh, man, I'm really working with this metaphor. There it's the go. one that dropped the acorns that grew into. It is the founding sequence, the DNA of the First World War, because it had to have a trigger. Yes, the historians are right. We are, it's important for us to say that there was combustible atmosphere. There were these the rivalries between the strategic groups, the strategic aspects of well, the they First were like, War. They were like, but they needed a trigger, and but, it could have been something else. But here's the thing. In the 25 years leading up to... The yeah, yeah. leading up, there were like a dozen the Agadir, that the were, Agadir were incident, the annexation crisis of 1908. I'm not going to list them because that's again beyond my Wikipedia okay. knowledge. But there was there were tons of people who were assassinated. What made what made Franz Ferdinand the guy that that started the whole conflagration? Okay, we're talking about the number two in an empire. This was a dangerous empire. It was an old empire. And it had great vanity and pride, but it was beginning to get weak. The Austro-Hungarian Empire. This was the problem. It was old, had an ancient history. And they were really cross that the other new empires, Germany, we think about Germany. Germany was only formed in the middle of the 19th century. It was only unified. Austria-Hungary from the 13th century. That's a really, you know, that's the difference between 60 years old and 560 years and old. And the dynasty... The, and the Haps, the, they were called the Habsburgs. We can call them a number of things. Franz Ferdinand is a senior figure. He is, in fact, number two. The Habsburgs go like way back. Seriously, way back. Yeah, to the twelve to the twelve seventies, um, and uh, he's number two. So, what does an empire do when it's feeling weak? How does it show strength? In this period, we're talking Game of Thrones here. Yeah. This is Game of Thrones yeah. era. You know, the Europe is not a nation state. I mean, you look at a map from this time, it is literally the Game of Thrones because they're all married to each other and interrelated. You know, the Tsarist, uh, the Tsar from Russia, the Kaiser from Germany, and the British, the English king, they're all cousins. They've all got the same grandmother. And it is literally Game of Thrones. You look at a map, there's no I mean, places that exist today, like Poland, they're not even on the map. And where did they get the plumbers from in 1910? Who it's knows? Just insane. Well, you know? they didn't have them. I mean, they were using tombs. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's like, so what does an empire do to show strength? It finds a small country that it can beat the crap out of. They love a little bit of imperial. Oh, march the soldiers up to the top of the hill and march them down again. Well, they do I'm that. coming it's from a you know I'm coming from a country that invaded Grenada. And, you know, come and, on, uh, this is a and standard. And you're coming from a country that did the Falklands. So the, what's so different? It's the standard standard behavior of an imperial power. The assassin, Gavrilo Princip, was able to. They were able to shape him into being an agent of the neighboring country, Serbia. Remember, he doesn't come from Serbia. He comes from Austria-Hungary in the same way as a Mr. Mm, Adolf Hitler comes from Austria-Hungary. He's the same citizenship, effectively the same Reise Pass, the same passport. That's the same thing. How but, was his art? Did he Did he, oh, did Adolf, he dabble? Uh, older, no, not uh, a, Adolf, we know. He Adolf, was kind of Adolf, failed Adolf's, Adolf's doing his art, and oddly enough, there's a bit of a parallel, because Gavrila didn't do art, but he did really crap poetry. Really? Oh, yeah, real. Can you, can you, give us a, can you break no, out I a stanza? No, I can't. I can't, unfortunately. What he did is he, um, well, he destroyed it all, but he was psyching himself up to ask the big literary figure in Bosnia would you look at my uh, art there once was a frau from exactly there was <laughs> there was an old man from Nantucket whose something was so long he could suck it you know all of that you know um, uh, but he that was his thing his was crap poetry Adolf Hitler was crap art um, but the point is what you asked, why did this make the difference? Why was the assassination of Franz Ferdinand this guy he was shot on a street corner in the Balkans. How come, a cafe. how come it spins out into the First World War? It spins out because Austria-Hungary wants to make a gesture to bash a small nation next door. If you bash a small nation next door, you're going to destabilize things. And the problem was that the other empires were watching very closely in this Game of Thrones as to who's appearing to be strong. And so the Russians were going to come in and say, stop Austria-Hungary doing that because we've got a little bit of an interest in coming down to the da to the Bosphorus and, you know, making a move on uh, Istanbul because we've had a good run of the late 19th century. The Germans, brand new kids on the block, they said, we're going to hang with our German brothers who are in Vienna. They speak the lingo, you know, we're, we're, you know that sort of thing. But in order to be able to, if we're going to do that, we're going to take on Russia. But hold on, if we take on Russia, the French allies are on this side. Shit, the other side of Germany. We've got to nip in there and sort out the French. So we're going to go in there. Through Belgium. Oh, yeah, we're going to go through Luxembourg and Belgium. Yeah, we got to go. And hold on, if we do that, the Brits are going to come into play um, because the Brits have a treaty. That's all known. That's all right, known. Right, right. And, and Germany, I mean, so essentially, Germany, Austro-Hungary said, all right, this is a great pretext. 
Well, you see, this is the point of my book. This is the point of my research. This is really the thrust. The First World War is different from other wars. It hangs in the air in a different way. Second World War, Saving Private Ryan, there's a moral clarity. We've done it to death. Steven Spielberg. Cold War. Let's not forget Schindler's List. Well, you know, we've, we've, you know, they kind of have a moral certainty to them. You know, bad guys with dark suits on living in Soviet Union, oh, and, you know, yeah. bad clothes and shitty cars, trabants, good guys with the walkie talkie, you know, all that stuff. Very, you know, it, that is grotesquely simple. But the Cold War, good guys, bad guys. Second World War, good guys, bad guys. First World War, good guys bad guys well actually they're kind of all the same it's a bit if, the, if the kings and the emperors are all the same cousins they've got the same granny and the soldiers are dressed in the same clothes and they're wearing using the same guns and that is the power of the first world war you asked about coming from northamptonshire in the, in the uk you cannot be from this country in britain without the first world war that was the next, in your dna that was the next point i was i was going to make uh, my my history goes back to in in you know i have a long line of um kvetching jewish relatives and so there's you know the holocaust still sends tremors through you know parts of my distant family i would say that the D, since moving to the uk the dna of this country has so much of the first world war in it it's almost like in in the states we claim oh yeah we you know my great 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 whatever they came over on the mayflower sure. here it's like even my wife her great grandfather died in the, in the Somme. Somme. Yeah. there we are yeah, yeah. so everybody has so a this thing. is the point this is my point which is the first world war is very very powerful in europe yes. britain hugely so germany less so france even more than britain the French lost twice the number of people that we did. We lost 700,000 people. And that's 2% of our nation state at the that's time. That's right. That's you right. Know. But um, it wasn't just 2%. It was the, the 2% who were like 18 to 22-year-old men. And it, how is, it's, it, and it has an amazing effect. Another knock-on effect of our DNA is that it hollows out all of those men, women who were in love with men, lost their men. And my great-great-aunt, great-aunt, she lost her this fiance. She yeah. never married again. She dies a spinster. So it hollows out a DNA line. So it shapes, yeah. it whittles. It's whittled our nation so strongly. So this is the intriguing thing for me. And why is it that we still you joke well not joke, but you made the thing about horses and you know Michael Moore Pergo and the and the a war horse thing or bird song a novel and you which was a great and, play you know, but not the, such a good movie the bird song the bird song uh, book was only written in the 90s and there'll be poetry and there's going to be stuff coming out this year it is an incredible seam that has not been mined out because it's so live whoa, now this is whoa, this is, hold on a second i've you, you even said in your in, in that there was a mentioned in the book that there was a bibliography, a bibliography published in 1960, 547 pages long, consisting only of books, articles, and papers About referencing Princeton. the Sarajevo assassination. Sure. There's that many books and articles on World so, War One. But, but what makes your book so great then, pal? I'll tell you what makes it great. Tell is me that about I, this seam that needs that to be I, mined. Is that, that what makes it great? is that we're stripping away all of this complicated thing. We're touching on the actually important thing of the First World War is, was it worth it? Was it worth it? The First World War poets, I mean, can you think of a poet from the Second World War? No, because the, the, the tableau in which they were working didn't lend itself to that. Vietnam in the American consciousness, uh, I don't know, for the Falklands, for the British, it just, uh, but the First World War, you know, you can th you can name them. It's Wilfred Owen. It's Secret Stone. It's uh, uh, Rupert Brooke. It's you know Secret Sassoon. You know, and just those we little lines. Just those team. little lines. Now, this yeah. is my intrigue. This is the thing for me. The reason <laughs> I'm going to sit here and try and say why is my book better than anybody else? No, else's. well, let, let, let me let me get you off the hook. Let me get you off the hook there. Just for a second. This is an important. This is an important point. This is a really important point. Why is it different? Because I'm trying. I'm trying to address this issue, which is why. The First World War has that sense of, was it worth it? Your wife's grandfather or great-grandfather on the Somme, was it worth it? And there's a lot of sense that it, it, it wasn't. Now, I've come through this research focusing on this young man, and I find this young man, the origins of the First World War, the trigger, is misrepresented at the very, very beginning. Vienna knowingly lie about him. They lie about him for their own hubristic, aggressive complacent, aloof reasons. They have this auteur of, I'm the boss, I can go to war, I don't give a shit, I'm going to misrepresent this guy. And the misrepresentation is this. He's a man from their nation. He lives in land that they run. He is one of theirs. But they say he's not. They say he's from Serbia. 
He's from over there. Mm -hmm. He's run by Serbia. He's run as an agent. They rounded up 25 people after the assassination and put them in a trial. There were 25 people in that court. They were all of them Bosnian. Not a single one came from Serbia. Really? That meant they're all the citizens of Austria-Hungary. This is the black hand. Yeah, well, this is part of, you know, they blamed, they claimed, and this is a claim, and it's been repeated by some very wise historians who frankly should know better. They claimed that Serbia ran this agent, and they ran this operation. And the, the, the thing for me is that I can show you a very, very different, and I believe utterly plausible and fully proven explanation that this man wasn't it was a purely opportunistic relationship he had with serbia and he was doing it for his own reasons now this is why is it important why is that is it in a bit subtle is it a bit inside baseball forget the names the details are unimportant but the theme is really important vienna lie <laughs> they lie okay. they misrepresent and guess what he said it i'm guess, just gonna roll and, over. and guess what as a result at the founding sequence of the DNA of the First World War has a corruption in it. And that corruption plays out, whether it's our image of soldiers walking slowly into the guns of, in the Somme or Gallipoli where they're sending New Zealanders and Australians to die because the Turks are so well dug in and they're so stupid or the other acts of folly and futility. Just marching people into the machine you know, and guns. And the, the, the trenches that don't move Mustard more than three guns. inches for five, for four years and hundreds of thousands of people die there or the Italians who die. 10,000 soldiers I mean, dying the images in avalanches. Are horrific. We have them in our mind's eye. Hemingway in the Alps in the Italian front, 10,000 soldiers are killed by avalanches on one day alone That's in right. December 1960. So many tales so, of so, horror. So, and this is the point. You, they are tales of horror. Are they worth it? And I'm telling you that if you go right back, right back, you, phylo, you do phylogenetics. You're a scientist. Genetics, oh, yeah. phylogenetics coming back to the common root. Holy cow, there's a corruption there. That's why my book is different. That's why the trigger is right. great. Well, I'm going to take you off the hook because this book has been reviewed just out of control. Everyone has been raving about it. It's going to climb the bestseller list. It took forever to get you into the studio because you're so important and such a high-ranking, well-praised. I am so jealous. I can't even look you in the eye. No, it's fantastic that because I think people are excited by the prospect of finding it because this is a this is a fig figure, Gavrilo Princip, that you can hang your hat on. You can go, okay, this is the start. It's a starting point for this huge conflagration that you can actually, it's a path that you can walk through history. And that path that you walk from that shitter to his birthplace. Mm. And that's really the course of the, that's really the course of the book was that walk. And I have to know, did you do part of it by donkey? <laughs> no, you know me. You've had me on the show before. I've done journeys through the Congo. Yeah. I get off. I get off on journeys that unravel history. That's what I get off. You went. You followed Livingston. Uh, Stanley, uh, Stanley, 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 Stanley. Stanley, sorry, Stanley. 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 He was an American. Livingston was an American. I only followed, you know, uh, Americans, intriguing Americans. Henry Morton Stanley. You followed Stanley in the Congo. In the I followed Congo. Graham Greene in, you followed in Graham West Green. Africa. I don't think he was American, but then again, my Wikipedia knowledge is true enough, true not enough, so great. True and so this it was one, an American colony or American territory, uh, Liberia. It was not right, not a glorious success right, in, the, in the colonial project for America. So okay, let's let's get to let's. So brass no, I get off on so journeys. You, you get the, off on journeys. So you followed Gavrilo Princip from the place of his birth, which is please pronounce the name of that Ubli 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 I Ubli I It's not spelled that way, and if you try to pronounce it the way it's spelled, Gary you won't Googly, say Ubli I. Oblii. And the the province, I love this little thing, the province that it's... Herzegovina? No, no, it's... Uh, um, Passage? No, it starts with passage. a V. It's got a... It's got a oh, here we go. Uh, Vukodjibnya. Oh, that's not a province. That's a very naughty, rude word. Yeah. <laughs> and it means the back of beyond. It means Vukodjibnya. Vuko, wolf. Vukodjibnya. It's where wolves fuck. Oh, we got ah. him to say it. We just lost him some Christian audience. Thank you for that. Now that is the Vuko Yebena is a. Uh, that's, is, is that a just a generic a, term for the a, backwoods? It's a colourful term in Serbo-Croatian, meaning the middle of nowhere. You know, the Montana Mountains, the you know, the middle of Scotland, whatever you know. The the north in Game of Thrones, like kind of up, up, up beyond the, the wall, up beyond, beyond the, the wall. wall, really beyond the wall. It's beyond the wall, and they but being Serbo-Croatians, the Serbo-Croatians are very passionate. They've got a bit of the Yebena word in there, the actual copulate. So it's where wolves make little wolves. Okay, so you went into the wolves. Anyway, so the point, but you ask a good question, which about is about the donkey. Uh, <laughs> you're slightly obsessed with the donkey. A little bit. Uh, a little bit. Uh, don't bat me. I'm a three-legged donkey. Um, 
the beauty for me with Princip is that he does not come from Sarajevo. So yes, he pulls the trigger in Sarajevo, but how does he get to Sarajevo? What journey does he go in? What space does he move through? What's the memory scape that he touches on? What are the myths that, that drive him? How do his horizons change? And he goes on a very long walk when he's a kid. He's only 13, 1907. His father takes him. Why does he take him? Because he's going to live a miserable, wretched life as a feudal serf. Look that word up. Medieval feudal serf. I mean, at the Game of Thrones, he's the guy shoveling the shit in the stable for the Lord and Master, right. polishing his chainmail. Medieval. Back. We're this talking, is, this, yeah. This is the intriguing thing. Europe, hey, where I'm from, Europe, surf means a totally Europe, different 20, type of... Europe, 20... Yeah, true enough. Sorry. Europe, 20th century, and there's feudalism. And this is the driver for his anger. He's got real anger issues about the Austro-Hungarians. But he goes on a journey. He goes across the mountains, and he goes to school. And this is his journey. Now, so, wait, that journey to school was like over mountains, across hill and dale to the city. 120 How, miles, 120 to, miles to a okay. railhead. Right. And these guys weren't stupid. You know, they How to long take, does that take, 120 miles, that march? You took that march. Uh, it took us a week. It took, us, um, it took um, you a week to walk those 120 miles. I'll tell you why. Well, you know, we're in, these are serious mountains. And, uh, that, serious, no, I'm serious. saying that's pretty good. That's pretty and, good time. Um, you know, it's, uh, this is wild. I mean, we're in Europe, right? We're in Europe where we've got our broadband connectivity and our 5G this and 5G. We saw a wolf. Can there be a better symbol? Yeah. A better yeah. totem for wilderness than no, I agree. a Jack London wolf mask. In the forest, there he is. <gasps> Pale eyes, tufted cheeks, hair, ears, gone. I've seen a leg. I saw a wolf leg in Alaska. I'm pretty excited about that. Was, was the was it alive? Or yeah, gone? no, no, no. It was on a, it was on a ridge and it was disappearing it was attached. very it was quickly. Attached. It was but attached yeah, to the, a live they wolf. they run ridges and look so this anyways. Is this yeah, is sorry. Europe. This is Europe, and that was cool. I mean, Shameful seriously, to bring that up. Cool. Shameful. And we're talking, you know, we're talking, we're walking through a war zone from the 1990s. But the other thing that's intriguing for me is the way that Gavrilo Princip's journey from his period, the Edwardian period, 1907, he went backwards and forth a few times, 1908, 1909. It goes over the same frets of history, the same bumpy bits where history plays out. We talked a little bit about it earlier, the 20s, 19, the end of the 20th century, the 1990s when a war um, takes place. He goes to all of these places that I knew from the war, even Srebrenica, which is incredible, but he walked through the mountains where the people from Srebrenica... So this is like a walk down horrible memory lane. It's, I would say, not horrible memory lane. It's just, it's just to, to rumble over the kind of you know, the speed bumps of history. We've got the Second World War playing out here. We've got Tito, a guy, you know, the communist dictator. He is in central Bosnia in these valleys, hiding in the same caves that Gavrilo Princip would have walked past, watching the same climate, the same summer storms coming crashing in from the Adriatic, the same topography, but 40 years later, but subject to different forces. And that's, you know, this is what I get off on. I get off on making history accessible. And the way I do it, as you said, is by putting my hat on an individual. I could do you the big, heavy historical treatise if oh, you it's, want. It's and been I've lost done. Already. There's 547 yeah. pages. And I mean, that's... Is, but this is the point. Try and make it original. Try and make it accessible. So that's what my challenge is, and that's what I try and do. Well, that's it comes across definitely in, in the book that you were going into the back, into the back of beyond. And I think what uh, impresses a lot of people in this is you found some, you uncovered some evidence that hadn't been picked over in the bloody 547 page bibliography. Yeah, it's amazing. You met tangential members of his family. Yeah. You uncovered some of his school records. Not some, all of them. I was amazed. No historian. Tell me, tell me about it. What, what imagine, it? imagine the 9 so, 11 bombers. If you could find the school reports from the madrasa in Pakistan, would they be important? Of course they would. They would yeah. be gold dust. I'm talking about the guy, the most, you know, the, the most influential assassin. Let's not judge him. I'm going to be neutral with these words. Right, Definitely yeah. the most influential. Yeah, he the most, did some He had the greatest yeah. impact. And no one's bothered to look at his school reports. He was 19, as you said earlier correctly, when he pulls the trigger. So between 12 and 19, he's at school. Let's see that. So anyway. What stands out? He did he square. take woodshop? He was, he, no, he was, he was good at gymnastics. Was and he, he was very, very well behaved. What stands out is he starts out as an A-grade student. Good soldier. I mean, not just a good soldier, a square soldier. He's, gonna, he's polishing the boots. He wants to become the sergeant of the little cadet group. I mean, he is the lead student in the class. And then you turn the pages the next year, a few Bs are coming in. A's become a B. His truancy's up. Why is that? Being a bit rude, his deportment, his behavior was he's gone. Tell me about his family issues at that time. Well... Was there Nine kids yeah. born in a family. Again, just remember, I mentioned feudalism earlier. We're talking the 20th century. It's not Downton Abbey. 
I mean, the Downton Abbey is that pathetic sort of rose-tinted... Don't oh, watch it. Nostalgia. Don't know it. Don't even well, want to talk of, about it. Some of your people will know as a reference. They do. It's a rose-tinted, Oh, I go home and people ask me about Downton Abbey. It's pathetic so little sad. simplifying version because it makes people feel good about the past. Let me tell you okay, what it was Maggie really Smith like a hundred years ago. It's a national treasure. Say again? Maggie Smith is a national treasure. Oh, she's cool. We, okay. love, we love Maggie Smith. Fine. But that rose-tinted view, let me take you to the real, the reality, the actuality. Nine kids... He's got nine kids in his family. He's one of nine. Three survive. Six okay. die. Now, that's Congolese numbers. Those yeah. are Sierra Leone numbers. Yeah. I know this because I do a lot of walking through funny places in, in West Africa. Oh, and those are the figures I would expect to hear in a village where there's been an Ebola outbreak. Right, right, right. Seriously. He saw this poverty. He saw how it impacted people, how his family suffered. What was his mentality? What was was there an event? Was he jilted by a lover? Was there a? Oh, I see. At school, yeah. Did he did he die a virgin? Well, we know he, uh, he, this is kind of cool, he gets to speak to a shrink when he's in jail uh, after the assassination. A shrink, a man called Martin Pappenheim, debriefs him and he keeps clinical notes. And we do love an Austrian psychiatrist because they keep very, very good clinical notes. And he uses the word, uncons- you, t- you said virgin, he uses the word unconsummated. He, have, he had a love, he had a passion for a girl and it was unconsummated, which I think in Edwardian means mean, they didn't even touch her. They didn't even hold hands. No alone, way. Let alone virgin. What was the thing that changed him? Changes him. He's in a town. He's away from home. He's in school. The young people are the, where, are the places where they're talking about change. There's this empires, this Game of Thrones, they've been around for centuries. The Habsburg have been around since the 13th century. They're talking about, hey, we read this. Have you read this thing? There's a guy called Karl Marx. He talks about the inexorable revolution. It's going to come. It's just the, the the proletariat will necessarily... Have you read that? What about William Morris? Have you read that? What about Dostoevsky? Have you... Hey, there's some Bakunin. You hear what Bakunin... He's really revolution. He's violent. He's they didn't have Game of Thrones back then. Yeah, and this is the... Ga- this, but this is, this is chat rooms. This right. is online this is- chat rooms. It happens to be not online in a coffee house, sitting with little thimbles of coffee with people playing bad folk music in the corner, thinking, how do we work this up? This is chat rooms. It's exactly the same. It's the madrasa. So of the that kids, time. Okay. So within that group, what's your first response? We're going to change. Well, your first response would be, well, what's the gradual option? What's the kind of, you know, can we, get a, can we change things peacefully? And there was gradualism in the air. There was a guy called Maastricht in the Czech Republic who was going on about gradualism and, and you know, in the Czech areas of the, of the empire, saying, we'll do moderate, moderate, moderate. But some, well, some kids, they did what you might call the Nelson Mandela. They waited, saw that gradualism was getting them nowhere, and just as Mandela flipped from peaceful ANC right. to, we're going to take up the guns, we're going to have um right. with Sizwe, we're going to have an armed rebellion against the apartheid regime, 180 degree change, that was Mandela's moment. These kids did it. And this wasn't happening a million miles away or you know, in a newspaper that you read about for Governor Princip it was happening on the streets of his city now hold on let me tell you about an assassination in 1910 oh Sorry, god you. hold on I'm just trying to keep I'm trying to keep him straight so he's being weaponized no no he is being Dis- radicalized he's being radicalized he's going from moderate to let's do some action and a kid a student in his 20s, a man called Bogdan Jirayach. Don't worry about the name. You'll certainly not be able to spell it. It's an absolute beast. But he does something. He attempts an assassination in 1910. Where does he attempt it? In Sarajevo. Where? Pretty much outside the flat or the house in Oparkan Street where Gavrilo Princip lives. So What guy, happens to the bullet? <laughs> actually, he shoots five of them again at his target. <laughs> And misses. He's not a very good assassin, not a very lucky assassin. But he then does something intriguing, takes the sixth bullet and <laughs> shoots himself dead. So Zorach is lying on the so ground. So he got the last part and right. And we've got, you know, a head of, you know, a pool of head blood on the, on the marble floor, on the, on the flagstones of an ancient Ottoman bridge. You know, you're going to see that when you go to school, right? And you're going to talk about it. You are going to talk about it. So it's, that's yeah. the climate in which this young man is being brought up. So the square student, A grade, A grade, A grade, is suddenly sitting with the guy saying, violence is an option. And this is the radicalization. He's a slow burn revolution. It takes him, not months, years, years to But he's out. 19. I mean, it couldn't have we, taken... It wasn't like he was. this well, was festering on. for 20 years. Well, no, well... <laughs> it in was, a relative, it was, it was in a relatively short time, and he was very young. And well, he didn't go. He didn't. He, he's not like. Um, he's not like. A, uh, you might say a jihadist who goes to the mosque and gets fired up, and then within three months he's in Yemen shooting guns. I'm talking about a kid, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, all the time getting more and more, in a way, 
boxed into a corner, like the Nelson Mandela. You know, this empire was not giving up anything. Now, you know, let me tell you how rough this empire was. When this man shoots himself in the head, the chief of police cuts the head off, boils it, and uses the skull as an ink pot on his desk. This is, you know, we use this wow. word, this is a tough neighborhood. Yeah. The chief of police of Austria-Hungary yeah. in Sarajevo, when he interviewed you, would drum his fingers on the top of the skull of Bogdan Jurajic. You know, that would persuade you to answer yeah, a few questions. Yeah, okay? I think, so I'd, it's a tough I think I'd answer. I'd give it up. You don't have to torture me. It's cool. I see the skull. I get the message. I get the pour encourager les autres. So, Pete, so, note to self, we, we need a skull in here. You need a skull. Yeah. You need a previous guest. You can go answer the questions. I've got a big head. I'll make a big... I could make a, you can make a bin out of this. Don't, you could, don't tempt me. You could make a huge... like a, You don't, like know, a what, you don't know what I'm packing. I'm American. Um, so, tough environment, grim conditions, foreign occupier. What are they going to create? You're going to create a bunch of students. Not all of them. Some square. No, but some square guys. There's going to be a few free radicals who go, let's take them on. And that's where Gavrilo Princip comes from. And he's got the unrequited love. So, you know, fuck the world. Sorry. Again, I'm working on the language. So, was there one particular actor who... I'm going to say, I guess the, I guess the question is, who taught him to shoot? Because, you know, he, he blasted. So, he goes... Um, uh, he goes off to uh, to the next door country, Serbia, to Belgrade, and that's where he falls in with some guys with guns. And he learns to shoot there, and uh, I believe, and all the proof is that the um, all the evidence is that he has the idea of taking out the Archduke. But the Serbians give him some weapons. But it's not the other way around. The Serbians aren't telling him to go and do this. this right, is what I don't want to ruin the end of the book here, but I am going to heartily recommend that people go and find their way uh, either through electronic means or to actual bookshops that sell. Uh, they're like hardbound things. They're made of paper, and they've got his, they've got the trigger on it and his name. Yeah, the, and the relevant thing is. The book is called The Trigger, Hunting the Assassin Who Brought the World to War. The other relevant thing is don't buy one copy, buy several. Right. Uh, well, we've, we've been quite honored to, uh, to have Mr. Tim Butcher, fellow Jack Russell Terrier aficionado, self-confessed hack journo, uh, we prefer the term Jurassic, to come to our studio and sit down yes, with us. Did. And thank you very much. We are full of books and full of other things as well, but I'm trying to watch my language. Uh, one last thing. Uh, dude, will you, uh, will you sign my Kindle for me? <laughs> I will virtually. I'll yeah, sign no, it virtually. no, no. Just right here I'll on the... I'll sign it virtually. No, seriously, right here. I got a cloth cover. Just, no, I got, look, no, seriously, I got, two, I got two books on here from you. Um, look, I got the trigger, and then I've got... Um, I've never I've been asked to sign this. You want to sign right across the screen? No, not across. <laughs> Are you a monster? And look, I've got Chasing the Devil here. Oh, Search wow, for. Uh, wow, yeah, wow, I'm not wow, telling him I'm a mess. We support our guests. You should come on but, and do a thing. But Just what about sign, when you get a real author? Sign the, Where do we get the real authors? Come this by? is a bestseller, dude. We got you in here. Come on, you're okay, one of the few okay. people who's writing books. Okay. And I'm Ian Wynn, the techno pagan octopus messiah. You've been watching Latopia After Dark here with esteemed author Mr. Tim Butcher and our super producer who's never up to, Sir Mr. Peter Cox. Uh, check us out. We got stuff online. We're launching, relaunching. We got things to sell. We're here. We're queer. Get, you know, that's something else. Anyways, thank you very much for watching the show tonight, and uh, we'll see you next time. And don't start any more wars, please. <laughs> <laughs>